Today, I'm joined by Phoenix College's own Dr. Nancy Wood. Dr. Wood has been at Phoenix College since 2008, first as an adjunct, and then as a full-time professor since 2017. Recently retired from facilitating psychotherapy to families, adolescents, couples, individuals, and groups, she continues to see pri clients privately in her part-time. Dr. Wood's area of interest and expertise is in the treatment of psychological trauma, particularly as it relates to culture. Introducing herself to students, Dr. Wood has said, I love my work. When you love what you do for a living, it's not just a profession, but a way of observing and being in the world that reflects who you are as an individual. It is a lens by which you view the world. Please listen in as I discuss drug policy reform with Dr. Nancy Wood. Here I am. Hello, everybody, with Dr. Nancy Wood of Phoenix College. Um, we are recording this interview, and that's okay with you, Dr. Wood? Absolutely, it's okay with me. Wonderful. Thank you for being Happy here. Happy to be here. I'm glad to have you. Um, is there anything that you would like to tell our viewers before we jump into our interview? I think uh, that I would like to remind people that any of the opinions that I share are coming from my professional experience and don't necessarily reflect uh, any organization or Phoenix College for that matter. Uh, I, I would think that this discussion is again going to reflect my professional experience. Wonderful. That's perfect. Um, my goal in this is to just bring a lot of different opinions and experiences to the table. Um, so opening up in your opinion and experience, uh, why do people change their consciousness despite knowing the substances they put into their bodies could be harmful or illegal or both? Um, I love that question. And it's really multi-layered. I think since we have been studying civilization, we will find people that um, have sought to change their conscious awareness of the world around them and of their internal landscape as well. Um, there are many ways that one can pursue that, right? Through um drugs through meditation through hypnosis um so i think that this is something that uh has been around for a long time and i don't know that i can really offer an answer as to why i think that People want to, um, they want to kind of seek an enlightenment of some sort, and they would like to broaden uh, their ideas of what it's like to be in the world and probably broaden their ideas of the world as well. So the second part of that question is, interesting to me because it's assuming that striving to expand our consciousness is a negative thing right so in the second part of that question you're saying why do people even though there might be detrimental outcomes mm -hmm. right um involved in expanding our consciousness why do people continue to do that? And I think that that is a whole lecture in and of itself because we would have to be more specifically looking at how we're doing that, right? If we're looking at substances that have a physiological effect on us and are building tolerance, um, and then we have one answer and we can go you know, in that direction. If you're talking, if you're zooming us up to the present day um, and you're asking quite a different question 
and I'm not sure what maybe you could tell me how you know what what were you thinking of when you posed that question well touching on on the first point that you brought up um everything that I've read and researched shows that yes for for time before recorded history even people were changing their consciousness whether it be through meditation or wine um, we're finding now that the the, an older definition of wine usually was spiked with some kind of herb or or um, medicinal purposes beyond just the alcohol that we know today. Um, so with history showing that this has constantly been a human thing and then only in the last few hundred years um, or specifically in the last 50 years, um, I feel like our culture in America has really tightened the reins on controlling or, or saying what is okay um, an okay so way I, to change your conscious and an okay way not to. I see. Okay. Um, because we have to include in there um, old systems, right? Um, meditation. If we think of people that have, you know, cloistered themselves like monks and who um, gain the ability um with extreme meditation and prayer to alter their consciousness um that is something quite different than ingesting something external to change what's happening internal and that right there has a great deal to do with problems that we see more recently is uh a genetic component or what science has come to identify as a predisposition genetically interesting to seek externally something to um, change what's happening in one's internal um, perspective, if you understand what I mean. So, um, so, so yeah, I guess what you're focusing on then is, um, modern day, you said within the last 50 years, modern day use of, um, chemicals to, um, change our consciousness yeah yeah i think awareness. yeah that 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 is my focus is i'd like to bring awareness to um governmental policies regarding external chemicals that change our consciousness um but as you said um we're finding those genetic predispositions um, um science is teaching us quite a bit more about repetitive use or addiction so in our modern world, despite underlying negative burdens that can be brought on by addiction, people still tend to fall into this repetitive cycle. Um, why might that be? Because that's the definition of addiction. <laughs> that is what addiction is, right? Is doing something repeatedly, having a negative consequence, continuing to do it and expecting a different outcome. So that is something that we can say philosophically could be a tenant and a piece um, of, of the behavior to explain the behavior. However, we also need to talk about tolerance, right? When you ingest a drug, regardless of what the drug is, um, and you have a feeling that is enjoyable to you and you want to repeat that again, there are most drugs that are going to need for you to increase the level of that drug and use more and more in order to gain that first feeling that you had, right? Among addicts, you'll also or people with chemical dependence uh you'll often hear them say you know they're always chasing that first high 
um, which is kind of an impossibility because the more tolerance physiologically you're building up, the more that you need. And of course, we know that the lethal level of some drugs stays the same while your tolerance, right, is con asking you to constantly increase the amount. So I think you're focusing more on um, why do people do that? Because um, if it is a physiological um, addiction and it's something that has changed our brain, has uh, messed with our feel-good hormones like dopamine and serotonin, which are usually the pathways, then what's happening is um, we, it's changing our rhythm of dropping those neurotransmitters into our bloodstream, right? So we are now altered whether we want to be or not. We're always in an altered state. Um, and we might not feel like we are, you know, in working with people that are chemically dependent you know, I've run across people that say, but I haven't gotten higher. I haven't used for, you know, two, three days, you know, and yeah, but you are still, you know, you have that physiological response that has been altered. And so you're think it's altering your thinking, your behavior, right? Um, so I think that's why people continue to seek it. I don't really think Zach, that it is a um, choice after a while. Because if it were a choice, it, just think about all the burdens, as you put it, right? That people encounter, right? Maybe they lost their job, they lost their relationships, maybe they've lost their children, maybe they've lost their housing, maybe they've lost, 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 and yet they continue to use. Uh, my response to that is, if they could stop, don't you think they would have by now? Maybe. So, maybe. So. Well, that brings up a couple questions. Um, if you're physiologically changed by these chemicals, and the change is desire to to continue um, making those neural pathways, whether it's your dopamine or your serotonin, if you need to continually affect those levels, are such changes permanent or, or do people- It depends, have, on, it depends on the drug. Uh, no, they're not permanent. And that's, I think, one of the hardest things in recovering people that are in recovery is learning, you know, how do I have a good time without this feeling? Uh, which brings us to the underpinnings. We have to remember that drug use is the symptom, not the problem. Okay. It's not the, un it's not what, you know, it's not what's causing it. So many times it's anxiety. I would say a majority of the time, whether it's social anxiety, whether it is just anxiety about life, um, unresolved inner conflict, um, just wanting to change how you feel. Okay. Um, and so, no, it's not permanent. It's not permanent, but it is also um, having to overcome once your body is, no longer has those drugs. Now you need to learn how to, um, you know, accept life on life's terms and not only accept it, but, but live it and, ha and, you know, be happy, joyous and free, right? Wow. That's saying a lot. <laughs> it sounds simple, but, but it's apparently a big choice as we, as we look at numbers of, of recovery and addiction across America. I don't think it's a choice. If it were a choice, then, you know, it's a disease. It is yeah. a disease. So um, we don't choose to have a disease. We have it. And we can say, hey, this will help us with this disease. We're going to always have it. 
We might not have the physiological stuff going on in our bloodstream, but we're always going to have that whatever it was that caused it to begin with, right? Okay. And we're going to have to look at that, and that takes a lifetime. It takes a lot right? of work. Yeah, it takes a lot of work. Um, we're we're using the term drug here quite a bit. Now that word has a has a very controversial effect. Um, you know, research shows that alcohol and tobacco both fall into drug. Um, can you explain, in your opinion, how did our society come to conclude what is a drug and what is it? Um, when did we start to determine what is socially acceptable and what is illicit or dangerous? Okay, so those are two different questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> One is how did society come to decide what is a drug and what isn't? Anything that alters your state of consciousness um, that you ingest is a drug. Caffeine is considered a drug, right? Um, and so I think you're asking now, jumping over to a more sociological viewpoint and saying, so how did this become a problem? How did this become problematic that people would like to change their consciousness using chemicals um, found in alcohol, alcohol, uh, drugs, you know, any, any other chemical plants, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it became problematic when people's behavior caused them to either um, be in distress or um, be dangerous or dysfunctional or deviant from the norm. And I don't mean that in a moral sense. I mean deviant statistically. In other words, if I am um, under the influence of a hallucinogen and I decide to, there's a lot of traffic, I think I'm going to Cross the street by crawling because it seems to me like uh, I'm going to have to make all the cars stop. So I decide to crawl across the street in the middle of traffic. So that's what I mean by deviance, atypical behavior. So I think that is when it becomes problematic for the individual. And then by association, the people that are directly around that those, that individual, the microcosm, the macrocosm, the community. And so I think that's when it becomes problematic. Hmm. Um, I, I see what you're saying. I guess as I formulated this question, um, you know, in this day and age, uh...